Welcome everyone to our final session of the fellowship. Um, I'm very excited for this session. Uh, Deborah Elms was kind enough to come back again for another year. Last year, um, she was uh, rated the most popular speaker of the fellowship. I mentioned to Su Lin um, that uh, we, and we'll get into this a bit more later, but we give you all evaluations to do and we really use um, your input um, as we're designing you know, each year's class. Um, so Deborah Elms is the founder and executive director of the Asian Trade, the Asian Trade Center. Um, she's also president of the Asia Business Trade Association. She's a member of APCO's International Advisory Council, the G20 Trade and Investment Research Network, and the advisory board of the Trade and Investment Negotiation Advisor at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Um, it's funny because last year, I think your topic was uh, the like alphabet soup of uh, trade agreements and I think her resume could, could be that too. Um, uh, she also uh, used to be the head of the Tomasek Foundation Center for Trade and Negotiations. Um, you can find her thoughts now on her Talking Trade blog. Um, and you really won't find anyone who is a, a bigger expert um, on, on trade policy and trade issues in the region. So um, with that, please join me in welcoming Deborah Elms. Thank you. Thank you very much. And because I'm the last speaker of your event, I thought rather than give you another presentation, what I would do is, well, the Americans would say I'm bad in cleanup, which is you're all out there in the field, you've done whatever you're gonna do, and now my job is to bring everybody home, which means I can answer questions that are lingering in your mind, rather than give you new information, and hopefully, of course, do both, but I didn't wanna give a presentation. So this is a bit risky on my part, I will say, because I have no idea what kind of questions, if any, you guys are going to have. And if you don't have any, we're going to have a really awkward silence here. So, but I'm assuming a bunch of journalists in the room, there cannot be a group that has no questions, especially after the end of a whole lot of presentations. So you all think for a second and start asking questions. It is rare that I'll find a trade related question that I can't answer. Um, so hopefully that gets us car our conversation started. So does anyone off the top of your head have a burning question? Fantastic. See, I knew this was going to work. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Han Hannah first. Hi. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm from Eco Business. I'm based in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been meaning to uh, approach you, actually, uh, to talk about uh, shipping, because it, mainly because I'm, I'm doing a story. Uh, about it. Um, so uh, just uh, this month, early this month, so the IMO came up with uh, new uh, shipping targets. Mm -hmm. What I just wanted to ask you was um, how would this affect uh, Southeast Asia in particular um, and uh, as well as the, the big shipping um, countries uh, which have a lot of stake at the, uh, on shipping like China, Japan, South Korea, and uh, Singapore. Yeah. Okay, so I said, I said you never know what you're going to get. That's a weird one to start with, but okay, let's give it a go. Uh, yes, ship, so, so what she's talking about um, is, I think, right, the climate-related shipping changes, yeah? So one of the biggest producers of carbon emissions in our logistics supply chains comes from shipping. It's not the worst, but it is pretty significant. And you can imagine for a trade-dependent region, and all of us, if we had the blinds up, you could see all the ships, of course, reminds you of how important shipping is for this region in particular, and how most of our trade actually moves by ship, some by air, especially high value cargo moves by air, but most of what we do moves by ship, rather than by road, rail, et cetera, because we don't have those networks quite the same way in Asia. So how does changes in shipping affect the region? I think it's a little early to say, because it's brand new, some of this legislation is brand new, but it's certainly um, likely to increase the cost of logistics. Because in order to retrofit or to have ships that are less carbon intensive or using alternative sources of fuel or less polluting or whatever, those ships either have to be retrofitted or they have to have new, new technology, new shipping. So the costs are likely to go up. Now, what does that mean for this region? Well, I think one way that we can imagine what that would look like is that we've seen shipping costs skyrocket, particularly in and out of this region in COVID. 
So shipping containers, and certainly any of you on a personal level who tried to move over the last couple of years will know that the cost of a container went from relatively small amounts. Off the top of my head, I want to say something like $1,000 for a 40-foot container, but I'm com I may be completely off, to something like $20,000 for a 40-foot container. So the amount of increase in shipping costs during the logistics, the pandemic, the disruption was enormous. I don't think we're going to be there with these new rules in shipping. But we have seen that even when you have tremendously escalating costs of logistics, you still have trade. And part of that is because you still have the production of things here. You need to have them there. How else are you going to do it? So I suspect that costs will go up. I don't think it will be tremendous. It will affect trade, but probably not catastrophically, particularly because it will affect all trade. It's not like it's just going to affect some trade, some carriers, some trade lanes. It will be across the board, more across the board. And so I think that is just a, a part of you know, the cost of doing business, basically. It may drive some firms to rethink production, manufacturing, uh, distribution locations. But I don't think it will be the trigger. And I'm sure you've spent the last couple days here talking about what are the other disruptions in trade. There are much bigger challenges than, I think, carbon rules for shipping. Most notably, of course, inflation and geopolitics, which have completely disrupted our trade patterns and may do so uh, for some period of time to come. So I think it will just be one more confounding factor that companies have to grapple with. Other questions? Not, not related to shipping, I hope. <laughs> Wait, I got two here. Fantastic. Hello, I'm Komail. I'm based in South Korea. I have a question I'm worried to ask even here, but I do the risk because uh, talking about trade is always, uh, of course, trade as much as possible is something that everyone like talk about and thinking about and found it as a, a like a very basic. But considering this carbon emission that you mentioned from any ports of transportation, isn't it better we focus on uh, like, like less, just, just efficient trade and changing the whole lifestyle mm. and having the trade mm. as less and as, as less as possible? Even? Mm. Like even, is, is it even can be a consideration? Yes, it's a great question. We've been getting a lot, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So this is a conversation that we've been having recently about whether or not globalization is dead. Have we finished? Are we, have we reached peak globalization? Are we now going to see the return to local, source locally, use locally, et cetera? In some markets, you see more of that than others. But I would suggest that even in areas where you think that you are, particularly for carbon, you think that you are being more carbon sensitive in your local purchases, sometimes, oddly, that is not the case. It can be. It isn't always, but it can actually be less carbon intensive to produce products in some locations and ship them than to produce them locally. And an example of that that I would give you sitting here in Singapore is we now have an objective in Singapore to hit 30% local production of food. So the government wants us to have 30% of Singapore's, because it's very food dependent on the rest of the world, have 30% of Singapore's food produced locally. But actually, that becomes very challenging. As you can see, crowded place. You need to use very carbon intensive and energy intensive methods often in order to produce products. Most of the farms that we have here are vertical farms, right? So they're, they need to have artificial light. They need to have water that's, that's dealt with them. They are produced at a cost and potentially a carbon cost as well that is much more than imported products. And so I'm not convinced myself that we can say that local beats not local, in some cases certainly, but in other cases, I think the math is actually off. I think it can be easier, faster, cheaper, and less carbon intensive to ship products. Again, not across the board. But I think it's a great question, and there are a lot of firms who are thinking about this, and there are certainly a lot of governments who are thinking about how do we ensure that trade flows moderate that we reshore, nearshore, friendshore, fill in the blank what shore you want to do, but that we do that. 
And to that, I would just say, although you might think that local production is less prone to disruption, I'm not convinced that that's true either. And the best example that I can think of recently has to do with baby formula out of the United States. So the US has, for I think we might argue some sensible reasons, a worry about trusting imported baby formula and a particular concern over safety standards and health reasons and so forth. And so the net result of that is the US market is incredibly close to imports of baby formula from anywhere. It's all domestically produced. And over the course of the last few years, we've had a lot of consolidation in baby formula to the point where we've had almost all US baby formula relied on one factory, which I'm not sure people were paying attention to, but nonetheless, here we have one factory. When that one factory shut, we had a huge baby formula crisis in the US. So this is local production using local cow's milk and whatever to produce formula. Factory goes down, US babies have no food. And because of the rules, it was very difficult to get foreign stock in to replace this. And so you saw images of people desperate trying to find baby formula for their children. Um, you know, this is, a, this is literally a sort of life and death issue for many. So that became a real problem. And it reminds us, or at least it reminded me, of why we have trade in the first place. Doesn't, again, let me just be clear. I'm not suggesting that all trade is great, that all trade is always fabulous, that there are no trade-offs in general. But I'm suggesting that purely a, a policy of pure local production can be very problematic on cost reasons, on uh, availability of products and services, and also potentially in carbon. Because again, sometimes it's much more carbon intensive to produce it locally than to import it from somewhere, whatever it happens to be. So I think the jury is a little bit out, but there are certainly a lot of stories about peak globalization being met. I think we sit here in Singapore, if you, again, look out at the window, you would say, this place is sure hoping that we have not hit peak globalization. Because if so, then a place like Singapore is in real trouble because it requ requires so much trade to power its economy, not just in goods, of course, but also services, investment, et cetera, people flows. And so a place like Singapore is very deeply invested in making sure that globalization is not dead and that we may not have reached peak globalization. But I think it's an interesting question and it's a story that's definitely worth following. And then the last point that I'll just make on this is trade in general and economics in particular is a combination of things, right? It's not just what firms do, it's also what governments do. And so as we have a completely disrupted global trade order, um, it is not always obvious how a government will respond. And a government could make policies that require globalization to slow down because they could make all kinds of rules that require local production, French shoring, et cetera. So I think it's not just what firms would like to do, it's also what governments will require of them or will in subsidize or enhance their abilities to deliver. So you have to watch sort of two parts of this, what governments do and what companies do to figure out, are we at peak globalization? Are we shifting globalization? And if so, what comes next? That is, I would say, the biggest question in the trade space for sure, that is gonna occupy an awful lot of time and attention and a huge amount of consulting dollars to try to sort out what does come after this. How are we gonna be structured? What are the new rules of the game? Who is in charge of those new rules? And how do we get to some kind of potentially stable outcome in the relatively near future? Because risk and uncertainty is extremely unsettling for companies. And it's, of course, unsettling for people as well. And so trying to get to some kind of consensus about what it is that we're trying to accomplish, I think, is, is going to be interesting. But it's why trade is so fascinating right now never probably been more fascinating than it is right now because for the last seven, eight decades, it's been consistent, set, settled. We knew what you were supposed to accomplish. We knew what the models suggested. We knew what the organizations were. And now we don't. And that is exciting and also a little bit alarming for people who are in the space. So that's my answer on the peak globalization, but happy to take any other questions that you have or argue about it.
I think Anton's next. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Matt okay. Hi, Matt, uh, with yes. uh, South China Morning Post. Yes. Um, so uh, also going off that peak globalization, a, a lot of the conversation around uh, peak globalization has to do um, explicitly with import-export data um, and, and other uh, related economic metrics. I wonder if um, you could say anything about uh, things that are maybe not captured in that in that mm. data that reflect globalization trends, mm. uh, maybe related to digitization, what's maybe uh, lost there, um, or uh, maybe anything else you could think of. Fantastic question. Our ability to keep data on trade has never been good and it keeps getting worse, uh, particularly here in Asia, where we have a lot of governments where if you look at their statistics ability and their collection of statistics, their publication statistics, it's a disaster. They just, they really, because it's, I mean, it's difficult and you know, the staffing is, is, is important and difficult and your salaries are low and your systems are not great. And so statistics have always been bad. And at a time of disruption, of course, even worse. So I think our statistics have never been good in Asia and it's partly why we don't really have, a, we have not had and still don't have a very good sense, especially trade flows in and around developing economies. We always revert to, when we talk about trade, what is happening in the developed economies in the OECD markets between Europe and the US and Japan and whatever. But that leaves out, of course, a lot of places that are deeply involved in trade. And so our statistics are terrible. And we don't really, we've never really known what they're capturing and what they're missing, but it's gotten worse. Added to that, there are specific gaps in our statistical ability that I think is important and becoming more important. You mentioned one of them, which is digital trade. It is harder and harder to be able to put a value on digital trade. So what is the value of a service like this one, where you're all from not here, we're giving a service to all of you, this is a service we're having, international trade service. What statistic would capture this? Who would be able to put a price on the value of the service delivered here in Singapore and the value in your home market of having you receive the service here. So our services trade data is particularly wretched and getting worse. I mean, as if it wasn't hard enough when you're all sitting here, if we did this on Zoom, we would still be engaged in international trade and services and trying to capture that data is really a disaster. Nobody has any idea what is the value of cross-border services trade delivered via Zoom or any other digital device. So digital is creating some challenges in terms of measurement. Services has never been good. We've never been any good at all about, even in advanced industrialized economies, at tracking trade and services. Because they're hard, right? Services is everything from construction and engineering to education and healthcare to travel tourism, food and beverage, et cetera. And to try to know, first of all, what is the size of that market? And then what is the size of that market that is traded? And what is the size of that market that is traded with another market? Very challenging. So our statistics on services trade has always been a problem. We also have a hard time disentangling the value of services from the value of trade and goods. So if we make something like a table, there is also services embedded in the production of the table. Because you have to have, someone has to design the table, someone has presumably some kind of design rights around it, IP rights around it, someone sells it in a retail setting, um, someone has legal to figure out whether or not the table is safe. I mean, there's a whole lot of services that are attached to the production of that table that we just don't know about. So services trade is a mess. Investment data can be a challenge. We do a particularly poor job as well with small businesses. So nobody has any idea how many small businesses trade, how many small, where are they? What are they trading? You can capture some of the aggregate information, but if you were to go and you were to ask any, any government, not just developing country, but any government, how many small businesses export? That export anything, services, goods, no idea. What is the value of people movement? We don't know. So in short, you all should go in and be statistic statisticians because we need a lot of help. <laughs> there are a lot of gaps and it creates a real challenge. If you're trying to make policy and your data is flawed or missing, you make flawed and missing 
I would argue, policies. It's one of the reasons I think, this is my own personal rant here, but it's one of the reasons I think why trade agreements are particularly challenging. Because when you do the economic modeling for trade agreements, the focus is entirely on trade and goods, and it's all about tariff reductions, which matter. You know, tariffs matter. But they're challenging. So here's an example, you know, my little tangent here on, on statistics. When the UK joined the CPTPP, the economic modeling that was done showed very few benefits to the UK. I mean, I think on the whole, there are going to be modest benefits, but I don't think it's going to be zero. But here's the challenge. Maybe, as, from a UK perspective, I never exported a product because the tariffs were 40%. If the tariffs go to zero, then all of a sudden I'm going to export. But our economic modeling largely ignores that. It says, let me take what you currently do, and let me, let me model what happens when your current trade flow has a change in tariffs. So if there's a current trade flow, I can tell you what that would look like when it costs, assuming that everyone actually knows about it and everyone applies the rules and everyone qualifies and everyone gets zero tariffs, this is the outcome. But first of all, none of that is true. Firms don't know, they don't apply, they haven't got a clue, they miss opportunities all the time. But even if they did, you might not have traded in something that is now competitive. So there are real changes that come from the way in which we manage these things. And part of it has to do with data. It's just easier to see tariffs. It's easier to measure a tariff. It's easier to put models around tariffs. It is devilishly hard to model new trade that doesn't exist, trade in services, the value of trade and in investments, the value of IP, you know, all of that digital. We, we just don't know. So we're creating policies in a bit of a data vacuum. Um, and I, that is a hard one to get around. Um, speaking about the government policies that could have impact, what do you think the effect of the South China Sea tensions could have on the region's, I guess, role in global trade, mm. as that being that being a key supply route? And then being from Cambodia, we're a really garment-focused uh, country, like mm -hmm. many of our colleagues in Vietnam and Bangladesh. How do you think the new German supply chain law is going to affect that, um, you know, exporting that work to, to countries like ours? Okay, let me take the, let, so we're gonna start small. We're gonna start with Cambodia specifically. So Cambodia and Bangladesh, both challenging, really challenging, because you have built up world-class garment factories, apparel production, largely on the basis of preference programs that you receive as a least developed country. So you have everything but arms into the EU, you have GSP into the US, you have other preference programs, not a lot, but another, a couple of other preference programs into key final markets. That has made it easier to export garments, which absent those preference programs, and this is the key point, tariffs, are, tariffs in particular on apparel can be incredibly high and super complicated. So, you know, t-shirts can have tariffs of, depends on the market, but, you know, easily 10, 15, 20%. Tariffs on swimsuits can be 10%, 20%. So up until now, Cambodia, Bangladesh, shielded from that through their least developed country LDC preference programs. As they both graduate, they lose those preferences. And the follow-on programs in the US and the EU that, that accompany graduation carve out textiles and apparel. So while there are some transition periods for some products, textiles and apparel by, by large, not part of that. So you go from having zero tariffs on textiles and apparel into your major markets to having no support whatsoever. All of a sudden, that full weight of tariffs are going to hit, and it's going to be really challenging. Governments, Cambodia and Bangladesh know this. Trying to figure out what to do about that, going to be challenging. So I would say on garments in particular, that is hard because you have to now create a comparative advantage in something else or have buyers for your final products who are prepared to and willing to pay more money to receive products from you because now they don't have tariff-free benefits. The, the only good news, and I mean, I don't know whether this is actually good news or not, but we have fewer and fewer LDCs. So it's not obvious where the alternatives would be. And I have received this question a couple times too. What happens when Cambodia graduates? Where, does the, where do those jobs go if we don't have a lot of LDCs left with those preferences? We do have 
and this is where it gets tricky, many now have other trade agreement benefits, including in textiles. So I would say RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, for example, has very easy textile rules to meet and zero tariffs or near zero tariffs, depending on which country and so forth. So that, I think, is going to cushion some of the blow. But the final markets for, especially for Cambodia and also for Bangladesh, is not really Asia. Final markets remain the US and Europe, which are not covered by RCEP. So that is going to be a competitive challenge. Um, OK, so now I just, t tensions in South China Sea. So that's Cambodia textiles in particular. I don't know if it's tensions in the South China Sea so much as it is changing geopolitics. That does certainly affect trade and everything else, security politics, in and across Asia in a way that we have not seen. And that will change the face of trade, but I think it's unclear how much. So when I get questions like this from a lot of people, I say, well, first of all, in the past, the past isn't that far long ago, let's say, if we said 10 years ago, what is the rank order of economics, politics, and security? We, I would have argued that in Asia, economics, largely, politics, security. <laughs> so the economics drives everything. Those other considerations, they matter. They matter in certain cir circumstances, certain neighbors, et cetera, but generally quite low. Compared to, say, the US, which puts security and politics high and economics very low. Europe puts politics higher in some ways, security a little less high, economics hard to say exactly, it depends on which European country. So one of the challenges that we're having is that as we have a compression between politics and security and a reshuffling, security is becoming much more urgent, politics is becoming more important, we may have, depending on the market, but I would say China ideology moving up, which we haven't seen in a very long time. I'm looking at your ages, and most of you can't remember it at all because you weren't born, but ideology closer to the top. That changes what kinds of policies we get. And it's the changing policies and the changing reaction, potentially, of buyers, consumers, whatever, that will shuffle trade. And so I don't think it's about so much South China Sea issues as it is the shifting importance of politics and security relative to economics. The way that policymakers implement these shifting changes and the way that firms respond, either because they have to, because regulations and policies are changing, or because they think that their customers demand it. And the net result of that is a whole lot of change potentially in this region. But probably not as much, just to, to sort of finish this question, probably not as much as some people think. I mean, I, I look at the Russian sanctions as an example. You say, wow, that is a dramatic, sharp adjustment in policy vis-a-vis -vis trade in Russia. And yet, the economic data so far, again, with all the caveats on data, do not suggest quite the same level of radical shuffling that you might have expected given the sharp changes in policy. So I suspect here we're in a more of a you know, frog boiling in the pot problem. It's unclear at what point we will start to see in policies, in actions, and in data real changes. And I suspect we will see less than you might imagine given the, hop, the, the popular narratives around this. So coming, yes but I think it's not gonna be as immediate or sharp as people expect. Yes. Hi, I'm Sushanta, Sushanta. And then we'll go, yeah, oh, there's a ton of questions. Sushanta, go ahead. Oh, I'm Sushanta Sina from Bangladesh. Yes. Uh, you told that there is a problem for Bangladesh and Cambodian uh, textile industry, but my concern is that mostly Bangladeshi textile industry are producing the basic garments and like the Singapore, this is the hub of international transport and shipment. So without this, it's difficult to transshipment in other countries like Europe and uh, America. Like in Bangladesh, if we don't uh, get the access to the tariff discount, how could you get the basic clothes? Mm. Because such a big um, volume of clothes cannot produce in uh, Cambodia or Chile or uh, Mexico. They have that capacity, but not like Bangladesh. So is it the concern for uh, not only Bangladesh, but also the Europe and American market 
people also. And another issue that is the issue of data. In Bangladesh, we have more than 50% of transaction is out of banking transaction. Like the remittance, we got $22 billion per year almost. And similarly, our finance minister is stating that the same amount of money is coming by uh, non banking channel. Mm. So if you go to the Bangladesh, there is a huge transaction in the locally that's not in accounted by the banks or other. And similarly, the um, uh, fees or levies that comes from uh, like the hospitals and doctor's fee or the uh, lawyer's fee, it goes to cash. Yes. So uh, we have two types of economy. That is the we show that this is the banking channel or formal channel. This is the informal, informal channel. channel. And both are equal leaps together. Yes. So it compounds, the, I should have mentioned it, that, it compounds the challenge of data, right? If the data, if your economy is largely informal, or if you have a fair amount of an informal economy, then obviously that's not captured by official formal data. It, it matters a little bit less, I would argue, for trade statistics, because you rarely have informal firms trading across borders. It's usually for local production consumption rather than cross-border, but clearly there is some trade that takes place that matters. Um, so it, yeah, data is a challenge and informal economy is always, you know, obviously informal, hard to measure, difficult. Um, so that is a challenge. Your textile question is a great one. You know, how do you manage this? I'm, again, I'm not suggesting that Bangladesh and Cambodia textiles go to zero, collapse completely or that it happens very quickly. What I am saying is that you're going to have unprecedented challenges because up until now, you have received zero tariffs, particularly on low value products. When those low value products get tariffs put on them, they're, they're low margin as well. They're low value and low margin. Profits get rapidly eroded if you have to pay a tariff. And if the tariff is 5, 10, 12, 20% on a low value, low margin product, that makes it very hard to be competitive. So it will be an issue. Again, it's not gonna be completely wiped out overnight. There aren't a lot of alternative places to go, but it is a question and it is a challenge. It's one of the reasons I would suggest why Bangladesh in particular is looking to, and Cambodia is very active, in trying to figure out how to use different trade agreements, how to be in them, how to join them, how to leverage them, because there you can get zero tariff benefits depending on what it is and how we've negotiated. And crucially for countries, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. Unlike these preference programs for LDCs, which go away when you graduate or go away when they expire, like the US, until the US gets its domestic house in order and finally updates the GSP benefits, those can be revoked. FTA benefits, for the most part, are hard to revoke. Of course, you could. All, all of them have a withdrawal clause and you could withdraw, but that doesn't happen. So that's one of the reasons too why we see a bit more, I would argue, of a stampede in Asia towards being part of joining leveraging trade deals. Because they give you those, there's sort of stability and certainty about what the rules will be, especially in sectors that matter to you, in this case, garments. Just to add, uh, this is Monira, I'm also from Bangladesh. For US market, it is fine because Bangladeshi Garment Center paying up to 16% tax. It's a, a major issue for European Union. Other countries like Japan, Australia, Chile, who are giving the duty-free facilities. But there are um, some rules of origin that mm. Bangladesh is trying to meet because there are uh, one stage, two stage, three stages um, facilities, I think. Not, it's my perception, it's the Bangladesh exporter who's are in belief that they will somehow adjust either with uh, bilateral agreements or mm. making the backward linkage industries. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, rules of origin are always hard and textiles are a nightmare. Anyone who's ever tried to export a garment to the US will know vividly how hard rules of origin for textiles are. Because the US requires in an agreement that they have something called yarn forward. So if I wanted to export this shirt, everything from the thread through the fabric, through every, it has to be from yarn that comes from one of the member states all the way through to the finished garment. 
that can be really hard. And that includes everything, the little, I don't know what these are, they're the coconut shell buttons or something and the thread around them. And the, if there was elastic on here, some elastic, super complicated. And there's a whole industry of people who support garment production just unraveling rules of origin for them to see whether they qualify. This is true also, I should say, under the GSP benefits and, and, and EU benefits. There are also complicated rules of origin. So you're used to that, but you'd have to change them into something else. Some agreements are better though. So RCEP as an example, RCEP largely is cut and sew. It was fabric, it's now a shirt, done. As long as the, it was fabric and the, it's now a shirt happens in an RCEP country, it qualifies. So that is a thousand times easier for com companies to follow than the previously compl unduly complicated protectionist policies we have in place to protect the last five garment worker jobs in the US and the EU. Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea San Juan, yes. a trade reporter for a Business Mirror uh, newspaper in the Philippines. Great. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, what do you think are the economic impacts of trade liberalization on a developing country's uh, local production? Uh, let me just relate this to the Philippines since, uh, let me just share that we recently uh, ratified the RCEP. And while certain tariff lines of sensitive agricultural products are protected from uh, tariff reductions under RCEP, I'm curious as to what will the effect be on our local production in general, because this is what our local agricultural groups are dreading. Are most worried about, yeah. Okay, so I, I wish I could say that we could get a trade agreement. It comes into force on January 1, and the economic benefits are felt on January 2. I wish I could say that on behalf of a lot of firms, and particularly for me, a lot of the small businesses that we work with, in trying to get them ready to do trade across borders. But I find, having worked on this a long time, that even the largest companies, the ones that you would think of as the most sophisticated, clearly they've got their act together, often completely clueless about trade agreements. So when you go into these companies and you start interviewing people and you say, hey, you know, here's this agreement, CPTPP, for example, I noticed you're trading chocolate biscuits from Australia to Japan, are you using CPTPP? And the firm will say, yes, yes we are. You say, great, can you point me to who in the company is actually doing this? And they will say, yeah, go talk to our procurement people. And the procurement people go, well, it's not my job. I think it's supply chain's job. And supply chain will say, well, it's not us, it's legal and compliance. Legal and compliance will say, well, that's not us. It's actually our software provider who does it. The software provider will say, we don't do any of that. We just give you the software. It's up to you to figure out what to do with it. So it might be the 3PL, the logistics provider. They do that. The logistics provider will say, well, that we don't, that's a value add service we don't provide. So there must be a consultant or something that does that. And when you do this whole thing, you discover that even the most advanced, industrialized, modern, whatever companies don't use trade agreements. So I think we worry about that a lot. We say, you know, on J January 1, something comes into force. On January 2, we will see this horde of traders coming across the border armed with all sorts of new, you know, competitive products that they're going to sell in our local market and we will be overwhelmed. The result is actually never that, or almost never that, because most firms are just not that organized. Most governments do a terrible job of explaining this to companies. Companies internally can't get their act together to actually take advantage of these trade agreements. And so although there are potential competitive pressures, and you may find them in some areas, it's not because of the trade deal. And let me give you my piece of evidence, should you be doubting my statement on this. India. India for years has argued that it is the India-ASEAN agreement that led to huge spikes of, of exports of agricultural products from ASEAN into India. The net result of which damaged farmers in India, it's a big part of the reason why India said we can't do RCEP at the last second, damage from this. We looked into this. There is not a single tariff change for an agricultural product anywhere in ASEAN India. Not one. <laughs> 
Not a single tariff was changed because they carved it out. The whole of the ag sector, out. So the agreement came into force. There is a spike, you can see it, in exports from ASEAN agricultural products into India. It is not because of the FTA, as in benefits from the FTA, because there aren't any. There are no tariff changes. I suppose we could argue maybe it's easier for paperwork, maybe customs looks more favorably, I don't know. But there's no obvious connection. And yet, this is an article of faith in India. It's because of the FTA. I think it might be because of the FTA, but it's not because the FTA provides benefits. It's just because everybody was talking about it. And so a lot of firms said, ooh, there's some new benefit it's going to be easier for us. We've never traded with India. Let's trade with India or let's trade more with India. But there's no, you're not using the agreement. You're not filling out any customs paperwork. You're not taking advantage of tariff reductions. You're just trading more with India because it's in your head. Oh, India, there's a big market. We should trade with them. So we see this a lot. We see this worry a lot about the competitive pressures on the domestic economy or on the domestic sector or a particular firm. I would love to say it's true. But having done this for a long time, I don't think it's as true as I would, as I would like it to be. And so I would suggest to you know, farmers in the Philippines, for example, first of all, take a deep breath. <laughs> Second, start thinking about opportunities for export. Because you know, Philippines doesn't export as much as it should. Um, and certainly doesn't utilize things as well as it should. And so if the Philippines were, were clever, especially Philippine firms, they would say, ha, huh, we're in this new agreement. We have opportunities. No one else is paying attention. Let's leverage them and actually export agricultural products from the Philippines into the rest of Asia. But I suspect we will see less of that again than I would like to see. Hi, I'm Shagun. I'm a journalist based in India. Uh, I wanted to uh, take back to the earlier uh, questions on where you mentioned that local trade is not always good, giving the example of uh, Singapore. Uh, so I wanted to ask as journalists, I mean, when local trade is not good, countries should look at comparative advantage of different commodities. So as journalists, what are the factors that we should look at when we are covering? What are the costs attached to, say, uh, a particular commodity, uh, if we produce it locally or we import mm. it? So one of them you mentioned was carbon costs. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about India because there's a lot of talk on deglobalization and localization in an Indian context. So what are the other things we should look at when we are talking about uh, which one is better? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, how, so the, the, if I were to reframe it, I would say, how do we find out what matters to companies about where they produce products? How do they decide when they're going to either open up some new investment or they're going to invest more somewhere or less somewhere? What are the factors that they consider? And again, as someone in the trade space, I personally would love to see trade like, what top, fantastic, you know, trade agreements, awesome. When I talk to companies, that is not so often the case, sadly. What do they worry about? They worry about tax. What are the taxes that they would have to pay? They worry about th very practical issues. Are there distribution centers? Are there warehouses? How much are they? How easy are they to get in and out of? How much storage capacity do they have? What is the total addressable market for the thing that I want to bring in? In other words, are there consumers, whether they're people or whether they're firms, who are interested in buying what we want to sell? Will they pay the price that we want to pay? Have we factored in the risks along the way? So there are a lot of risks when you go into new markets, everything from you know, delays, side payments, um, challenges around staffing, around talent, around IP loss or IP theft, uh, lots of things. And so firms, if you ask them, will give you this long list of, of issues. So I would say, how do we know whether you're going to produce locally or not? Well, again, I, I'm not a journalist, so this is a little hard for me, but one way that I can imagine that you could produce a good story is you go and you start talking to firms and you say, look, if I gave you $100 to invest, where would you put it? it to do, figure out, you know, a very concrete example, where would you put that $100? And then you unravel why. So if the answer is not here, then you say, well, that's very fascinating. Why not here? What is it that's stopping you from doing this here? Or why there? 
again, what's, what are the motivating factors? And I think you will find it's a, it's a complicated mix. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes, to be honest, it makes no sense at all. So if you talk to firms about their current supply chain footprint, you will find that firms, for example, will often locate stuff for no sensible reason at all. It was because the original person who started the whatever was from there. And he, usually it's a he, wanted to go back home. And so he set up whatever it is, the office, the factory, the production facility there, and then it grew. It wasn't like a thoughtful, nobody sat with a map and a whole spreadsheet and said, let's think about where we want to do this for purely practical, rational reasons. It's usually an accretion of decisions along the way. The guy's family lived there. We made an acquisition. When we acquired this company, that's where they were located, and that's just where they've stayed. And it takes a pretty hard shock for a firm to say, let's rethink what we're doing and where we're doing it. It's much easier for a company to say, we've been doing this. We're going to just stay on that glide path. We might adjust it a little, but we're not going to like throw everything out and start over again, because it's just too, too costly, too risky, too uncertain, gaps in production or whatever. So firms tend not to do that. When you. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Wen Yili from Taiwan Business Weekly, and I cover the semiconductor industry. I was just wondering, I uh, just wanted to continue the, uh, the globalization discussion. So um, Taiwan chip maker TSMC mm -hmm. founder Morris Zhang has said that globalization is almost dead. I was just wondering, how do you see that in the chip sector? Uh, mm. Like, where are we going? Since like every country wants its own uh, foundry and chip factory. Yes, but happily for TSMC, nobody else can do what TSMC can do. So you can say globalization is dead and everyone's going to make their own semiconductor production. And you can make a fair amount of your own semiconductor function in some markets, but not all. But where you're really going to struggle is the investment at the top end. And that's where TSMC has the lock. Um, and it's so expensive and takes so much knowledge, equipment, skills, development, et cetera, to replicate that, that it is hard to, it's hard for me to imagine very much success from whatever it is you try to do. Even if you throw a ton of subsidies at the problem, I don't think you're going to solve this concentration, particularly for the high-end semiconductors. That's a slightly unique example, to be fair. We don't have a lot of examples of firms or sectors or products that are global, going to stay global, and that concentrated. And so I think semiconductors is unique. But certainly, because it's unique, and because it's part of the whole gotten caught up in politics and security, it is going to be hard to stick with exactly the same footprint. You have to do something. You probably can't stick with exactly what you have now because of all these other tensions and problems. But the idea that somehow you will have the rise of a dozen new competitors to TSMC, for the, especially the high end, I can't imagine. It would have to be some kind of a catastrophic adjustment that requires firms to say, we don't care how much it costs, we're getting enough subsidies to cover it, or our customers will just have to figure out a way to pay more, and you all, as consumers in particular, will have to pay a lot more for a lot more things. I think that's unlikely. So I think you will see adjustments. Certainly semiconductors is, as the Americans would say, the tip of the spear, uh, where everything gets really complicated in a hurry. But I, because of, and the reason why it's the tip of the spear is because of the structural nature of that particular product that makes it hard to adjust. So I think, again, we will see some changes around the margins. But the, for me to imagine the rise of multiple TSMC competitors in multiple markets that are not TSMC, TSMC itself could potentially locate production elsewhere. But it, it will also be smart about this. It's not going to say, well, I'm going to put it everywhere, or I'm going to put it in here. I'm going to put my crown jewel somewhere else. Hmm, probably not, because the risks are high. So we'll see. But I don't, I don't expect the kind of distribution of semiconductor production that governments are hoping for. The last point I would just make on this that's not necessarily related to semiconductors, but I see an alarming narrative in the media, hopefully none of you were part of this, that says essentially that a, a government decides X. And therefore, their companies will do X. 
as if somehow companies are assumed to be foreign policy agents of a government. And I think that that is a false narrative. I don't think firms get up in the morning, CEOs do not put their feet out of bed and go, I am a Singaporean company, I must at all times and in all places reflect Singapore's foreign and economic policy. Or I am an American company and I must therefore be an American doing whatever it is that the US administration wants in the minute. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen, wouldn't happen, can't happen. So I think we need to be a bit cautious about assuming that because a firm is something, it will behave in a certain way. Because even our, our most you know, intense local champions are often have foreign investors, have foreign platforms, have foreign production, et cetera, talent, who knows. And so again, to, to just make this assumption that firms are an agent of the government, I think is, is, is a problem. Lisa? Uh, I have a follow-up question. Um, yes. Lisa from the Wall Street Journal. You know, just stay on tech and semiconductors. What is the biggest, starkest change to tech supply chains in the region since the chip kind of export controls kicked in in October 2022? Well, I would say the most obvious change to me is just that, that suddenly the, the, the rank order of risk for firms changed dramatically, right? So this may not have even been on an agenda, now it's definitely on an agenda. So rank order for risk and options changed. And options have changed, especially in tech, because in some areas we have subsidies, in other areas we now have punishments. Um, and so the tech sector, again, part of, broader than just semiconductors, is facing a different environment than they were facing even a few years ago. Because it's relatively recent though, as it gets sort of, as these policies get rolled out and as these policies get to be implemented, I don't think it's clear to me yet exactly how firms will respond. And I suspect, going back to my point I just made, that not all firms will respond in the way that governments imagine, right? So the US government, as a simple example, assumes that firms will reshore. We will make it difficult for you to do whatever it is overseas, you will come back to the US. And I think that's flawed thinking. Some firms might come back to the US, but frankly, the US is expensive and difficult and doesn't, isn't necessarily connected in ways that other places are. And so even though, again, you may say, well, you're an American company, you need to follow American rules, firms will say, that doesn't work for us. We may reshore, we may, we take our $100 of investment, we may put $2 of it in the US, but $98 are gonna be somewhere else because we need to diversify our own risks, because our customers demand it, because we need to be closer to markets, whatever it happens to be. Warehousing is cheaper, fill in the blank what? That's what we're gonna do with the money. Hi, um, I'm Angie from the Conversation Indonesia. So um, my question will be about, like, uh, about trade protectionism mm. and um, economic nationalism, basically. Mm. So uh, as you know, uh, more or less, this is about like the biodiesel saga between Indonesia and the U in European Union. Um, so like, yes, uh, we know that uh, palm oil is definitely not the greenest source of energy. And, um, uh, but the issue is here among the, the complaints that is uh, filed by the EU, it is stated that uh, biodiesel from Indonesia, um, you know, uh, harm producers mm. from inside the EU itself. So uh, basically, this is uh, not only simply about the environment, but about protecting their own trade. And on the other hand, on the other hand, we also Indonesia also like protect or uh, ban <laughs> or many things. Yeah, ban <laughs> many things. But the question here is, if we don't ban it when we will be free from being just a uh, raw materials exporters and uh, trying to uh, apply uh, added value uh, exports here and catch up with other countries in terms of economic growth. So what is actually the, what is actually unfree and unfair trade is? Mm. Well, we could have a whole day just on Indonesia, but I would say if Indonesia wants to move up the value chain, it could make doing business in Indonesia a lot easier. Could make it a lot easier for foreign investors to come in, 
and the protectionist nature and the very rapidly shifting regulatory structure in Indonesia makes it hard for companies to invest. It makes it hard for companies to invest for the long run in particular, which you need to do in order to move up the value chain and especially in some of these more expensive operations. The track record in Indonesia specifically is problematic. So I think that for Indonesia, to, again, we could do this for a day, but we'll just start with that one. So if Indonesia wants to compete, it needs to be prepared to compete rather than protectionist. But this is, again, my own bias, um, having done this for a long time. But that doesn't mean that Indonesia is the only one that's protecting. And I mean, we've always had tensions between being open and being protectionist. There are arguments, and, and we can argue about those again, about the value of protection, protection for jobs, protection for workers, protection for a particular sector, infant industry arguments that you can't develop whatever it is if you allow foreign products in. Um, but I would argue there are better and worse ways to do that. So you have to be, in my view, very clear about what your objective is. You have to choose approaches that actually meet that objective. And you have to be flexible enough to stop them. And this is the hard part for governments always. You'll be able to stop them when they, when they are no longer productive. And it's the stopping that is a nightmare. So an example I give all the time about the difficulties of stopping is the most perverse set of policies out of the United States have to do with the protection of sugar. So in the 1940s, the United States decided that because of World War II, they needed to make sure that American consumers could still bake a cake, literally. So they start putting in place very complicated protections for sugar. The net result of that is that the US pays six times the world price for sugar, six times, and has for decades. So how do firms respond to that? Six times the world price for, for sugar, they find alternatives. Well, one alternative that they find is corn sweetener. It turns out corn sweetener, also sweet, horrible effects on obesity. So here's the United States, decades after the original protection still protects the hell out of sugar, moves into corn sweetener, artificial corn sweeteners, which have obesity and health implications that the United States is never going to get away from. And it's all because, I would argue, you couldn't stop protecting cake production in 1945. Could you have a more perverse set of policies or a better illustration of why subsidies and protectionism are a problem? It's not just the, the original intention, again, can be good. But getting rid of that protection once it's in place is just so difficult to do because you get entrenched. And you say, well, if we didn't have to pay six times the world market, then sugar would obviously be not done in the US or not done in the same value, not done in the same places. So protectionism is an issue. And I would argue one of the big challenges we're having right now is that we have had strong incentives for protection always. That's why we have the WTO and the original GATT system. The original GATT system was designed because people said, they looked at World War II, they looked at the Great Depression, they said, we all have an incentive to want you to be open and me to be closed. That's the best world for all of us. Unfortunately, if we all follow our instincts, we will have a closed world. So what are we going to do? We're going to sort of lock our arms together. And in conjunction with one another, we will slowly and painfully open our markets together. And we will avoid the siren call of protectionism. That system hasn't worked beautifully, hasn't worked always, but it's worked relatively well until recently, where the consensus around why this mattered broke down. The US in particular went off and did crazy things. The Chinese are doing all sorts of nonsense. And the net result is we don't have the same dampening effect on protectionist incentives that we used to have. So governments are now exploring. And it's not, again, it's not just the usual suspects. It's the United States. It's the Europeans who are suddenly exploring all sorts of protectionist policies in ways that they hadn't before, particularly around subsidies for the, for the countries that can subsidize subsidies. This is, this is a real challenge. So this rise of protectionism is likely to be, in my view, one of the big stories over the next five to 10 years. How we manage that, how we deal with it, what are the economic consequences of that? And it will be felt unevenly, as everything is. And I would argue, most badly hit will be developing countries, as they always are. Because when you close off big markets in particular for domestic protectionist purposes, you hurt small producers in developing countries. 
every time. And so I think that is going to be a real challenge. And we already have inequality concerns and worries and all these new challenges. That just adds to tension. And I would say the Europeans are so excited with their ability to have extraterritorial application of their own rules, which is what they call it, which means my rules are your rules, and I can impose them out. They're so excited with the success of this that they're trying it in lots of different venues. And I think that is also problematic because frankly, Indonesia is not Germany. And to require Indonesia to be under the same production processes, methods, labor standards, environmental whatever, as Germany, in, in German, German firms in Germany, is crazy. So we have to have some, in my view, recognition of some developmental differences as we create policy, but it is getting harder to keep governments from thinking protectionism first. So again, I'm not suggesting that free trade or more trade or liberal trade is the solution to all things. But I do think that protectionism comes with a whole lot of collateral damage that we haven't seen because we haven't really practiced it in the way we're about to. It's 12.03. Do you have a hard stop or can you take one more? I can take another one. OK. Manish, last word. Hi, uh, this is Manish. I uh, work for news agency in India. So my question is, in fact, almost you have touched upon uh, the issue that I want to ask. Uh, I mean, do you expect any kind of uh, uh, reform in policy framework in the emerging markets, markets that are actually registering impressive growth, including India? A lot of people are bullish about India, but uh, people also say that it is very difficult to do business in India. So uh, do you expect any kind of uh, reform uh, mm. that, that, that can boost growth mm. uh, in countries like uh, India, Brazil, and emerging markets? And second question, in fact, IPEF, this region, ASEAN region, has also been you know, witnessing uh, the big geopolitical uh, power play. Uh, a lot of people are trying to influence ASEAN. Uh, and uh, when IPEF is rolled out, uh, do you see the growth trajectory uh, goes up or, or uh, there'll be some kind of, again, uncertainty? Mm. Uh, because ASEAN is also trying to create an ASEAN community, right? And we have IPEF, we have RCEP, and so many frameworks mm. in play. So uh, what would be the uh, impact of rolling out of IPF for this region? OK, those are some big questions to end with. I'll try to make them short. Again, we could do a whole day on IPEF, um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. My short answer on IPEF is I don't expect any changes economically out of IPEF. It's a framework for a discussion of future issues. Useful. You guys will follow it. I think that's great. Conversations need to be had. That's fabulous. But I think in terms of business use, I don't even know what a business would do with that. So if we look at the supply chain pillar for IPEF, for example, which is finished after a remarkably short number of rounds, they made three committees. Now, again, I can argue that it's important. We should have conversations about what are we going to do about supply chains and about the collateral damage and lots of things. But if I'm a company and I look at that, I go, fat lot of good that's going to do me. They're going to sit around and chat about stuff, and someday they might do something. That doesn't affect my bottom line at all. And I certainly cannot go back to my C-suite and say, hey, this agreement came out, and I get a conversation and a lecture. <laughs> um, you know, That is not helpful. So I don't think that IPEF itself will have impact, and certainly not in the near term. It could over the long run. They're discussing some useful things, but I don't, it's not the same thing as a trade deal where you could take advantage of tariff reductions, services liberalization, changes in IP rules, et cetera, on day one. We will not have that in IPEF. The, the first part of your question, I think, is, is, again, we could have a whole week on this, but where do we go from here? The larger question, if I reframe it, where do we go from here? And in particular, how do we ensure that Developing economies and emerging economies have a voice. Smaller countries have a voice. How do we, if the system that we've been familiar with for so long is breaking down, what do we do about that? Who's going to be in charge of that? You know, if we don't have a functioning World Trade Organization, which, let me just look at your age again, most of you have never seen a functioning, really, a functioning WTO because it hasn't done anything since 1993. Um, or done very little since 1993, that's a problem. What, what are we going to do if that doesn't work? I think eventually we're going to have such chaos, we will all come back. 
So if you're young enough, you still have hope. Someday before you die, we might have some kind of consistent rules again. But between now and then, it's going to be very unsettled. And I think you will see governments trying to coordinate, cooperate. That's what IPEF is about. There will be other such initiatives. So we see Singapore is pushing a lot of them on digital, in particular digital out of Singapore. New Zealand is working really hard on climate related sustainability discussions. Australia and Canada working very hard on gender inclusion. So they're trying to take pieces of an agenda and create some kind of consistent set of rules around them. But the broader, when are we going to get 164 countries to agree, I think is a long ways off. So again, alarming, but probably great news for journalists, because that means there's a thousand and one stories between now and then about what is not working, what was working, what we thought was going to work and didn't work, what we think governments will do, what we think companies will do, what citizens will ask for in response. You know, trade, continue, in my view, continues to be extraordinarily interesting at a time of disruption. All sorts of things that were never on the table are now on the table. And the short answer to this very long question is, I don't know where the future will be. And I certainly can't predict in the next five, 10 years what a system will look like and how we can ensure, ensure better representation and crucially for me, results on the ground. Because we could all sit around and chit chat and that's lovely, but ultimately we need to do something. And so when, that, when the, sort of we move from the chit chat to the do something, I think it's gonna be a while. I'm so glad we ended this way um, because it was a chance for all of your loose questions to be tied up. Deborah Elms, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>